Okay, let's go ahead and get started. I know I, I ran late this morning, so I figured I'd start late for the Bible class, and this is late. <laughs> but uh, open your Bibles to John uh, chapter 4 right now. We're actually in chapter 6, uh, but there is, I want to begin with what we already looked at, chapter 4, because this is the, where Jesus is speaking to the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman, and he relates the teaching he has as living water. And he's using the water, of course, they were at the well um, that, that she was drawing water from, and he, and he asked for water, um, of course, to start this conversation. And so the, the, the topic here is water that she's gathering, and he uses this as a launching pad to discuss what he's really all about. And he reveals to her that he's the, the Messiah in and the, and the way that he told her everything that she ever did. Of course, at least enough, he told her enough about her life that he perceived he was a prophet, she realizes this is the promised one. Okay? And as he relates, the whole idea was about he's the living water. That uh, Rather, he should say, I should say that if, any, if you knew who I was, you'd ask me for water, and I'd give you this living water that you'd never thirst for. Of course, he's talking about spiritual matters. He's, he's relating it. They're drawing water to, to sustain our lives. We all need water to live. But I've got living water, water that when you start drinking of, you'll never die. And so, with that idea, he's introducing himself as the Messiah. That with, his, with the teaching he brings, you'll live forever. Of course, we know that the teaching he brings is the gospel message that, uh, and his dying upon the cross and, and all. And that message drives us to obey the gospel. And uh, we find forgiveness of sins. We find everlasting life through this living water. Okay. And so, when we get to chapter 6... It's the same kind of illusion he uses, physical examples he uses to portray himself and the import of him. And like I said last week, it's not about, he's trying to get them to stop thinking about their security they have in the law of Moses. Because they thought they had, because they had the law of Moses, they, they, they're surely be, uh, uh, they're shoo-in for heaven. And the other aspect is that Believing they are, they are the children of Abraham, they're descendants of Abraham. Therefore, because Abraham is their father, they, have, they are a shoe into heaven. He's, Jesus is trying to get them to stop thinking that way. He's trying to make them realize, you have to believe on me, uh, the Messiah. And everyone, everyone who will ever be saved, have to believe on Jesus. Even Job believed on the one that would come, which turns out it's Jesus. Okay, And so... All men everywhere will all be saved in that faith in Jesus and not in anything else. So as we look at this, it'll make more sense when we get to the part where he talks about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. Okay, so in, we recall that there was, there was in chapter 6, there was the miracle of feeding the 5,000 from two loaves or, or some loaves and fishes, right? And so they, had, they were all satisfied. They had enough to eat from this, and they had 12 baskets left over, a wonderful miracle. And as you know, he perceived they, were, they, they, they understood that Jesus is that promised one, so they were going to try to force him to become their king. And so he departed. He went to the mountain afar and, and to pray alone. His disciples get into the boat, and they start rowing to Capernaum And about... Uh, a certain number of hours later, he, they see Jesus walking to him on the water. They hadn't gotten very far, about 25 or 30 furlongs, which is about what, maybe two and a half, three miles. I don't know specifically, but it, it, general, uh, that it, it was a distance that was insufficient for the amount of time they had been rowing. It was, the wind was hard against them. And so Jesus walking on this water, of course, uh, uh, what, they were afraid. They were frightened because of what they saw. They thought they thought, saw. They thought they saw a spirit. Okay, so Jesus enters in the boat, and as this account says, immediately they were, in, they were on, at their destination. Now then, the next day the people realize that the boat's gone, and Jesus is nowhere to be found, but they knew that Jesus didn't get on the boat to go. So they're wondering, so they, they, those that could caught a boat, or however they went or walked over to Capernaum, and they asked Jesus, how and when did you get here? They were, they were a bit, uh, this is where we pick up in, in verse 25 of chapter 6. Um, actually, we can see verse 24. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, neither his disciples, they also took shipping and came to Capernaum seeking for Jesus. 
And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, when camest thou thither or hither? And uh, so, so they're asking, when did you get here? Or and in fact, how did you get here? You know, they they were they were a little confused. But Jesus cuts this cuts to the straight. He cuts to the chase. He did, he knows what's on their mind, and he deals with the issue. Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say unto you, ye seek me not because ye saw the miracles but because you did eat the loaves and were filled. Um, this is the implication that you saw the miracles, but you didn't believe in me. Rather, you, uh, but rather, you're motivated being here because you got, the, you got fed. And you're here because you want to be fed, not because you're looking, after, uh, looking for me because of who I am. The, the miracles testified that Jesus is the Messiah. He told, we've read that where, the, where he was telling the Pharisees in Jerusalem that, that the Messiah. And so when they're witnessing this miracle that was performed, that didn't impress them. They didn't, they didn't come following him because they saw him that perceived him as the Messiah. They came because they wanted to be fed. Jesus tells them, labor not for the meat which perishes, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which, is, which the Son of God, man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father healed, sealed. Just like he had been talking to the woman at the well, telling her about he would give them give her living water for everlasting life. He's telling these people that had followed him because of their loaves that, that he would give them meat that, uh, that would endure under everlasting life. The Son of Man, speaking of himself, give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. The God the Father sealed. You know, we use seals. We're familiar with the idea. We've seen an old movie where the king makes an edict and it's to be proclaimed throughout the land. He, he folds this this uh, uh, doc document proclamation, he folds it up, and then he pours wax on it, puts his, his royal seal on it. It's been sealed. It's not been tampered with. It's, it's official. It's, it's, it's declared by the king himself that this is his edict. Uh, more modern times, uh, on your computers, on your laptops, you turn it over in the back or you look at the top, you'll see a seal on it. If it's got Microsoft software on it, you'll see the Microsoft seal on it. It's very pretty, very colorful. It's almost a holographic. But it's an official seal to identify that the software that's been installed on that computer is officially from Microsoft. It's the real deal, the real thing. And so as we read here that as Jesus said, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed, God has stamped, put his seal of approval upon the Son. Remember when he was baptized by John the baptizer? Um, that uh, when he came up out of the water, the, uh, uh, the Holy Spirit descended upon him like a dove. And then there was a voice heard from the clouds, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. God gave his seal to, to Jesus. And when he had told the, the, the Pharisees that God testifies of him, and then his performing the miracles, including the feeding of the 5,000, it was a seal of approval by God the Father, that he is the Son, that he's the promised Messiah. And so they had no reason to doubt that his giving them that, that meat that would, unto everlasting life would be exactly that. Okay, it's, it's, it's the real deal. And they said unto him, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? Uh, Jesus answered and said unto him, this is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he has sent. So we discussed that last week. Believing on Christ is a work. It's something we do. Okay? It's not just mental assent. And so it is a work of God, eliminating the idea that we're, we're not saved by works, but by faith. We are saved by, by faith. And it's not merit, self-meritorious works. That's a fact. But faith is a work. So we cannot just make a blanket statement, we're not saved by works. In fact, we can see from James chapter uh, uh, 2 where faith apart from works is dead, just like the body without the spirit is dead. So faith must be exhibited by something we do. And so we see here, faith is a work of God. Okay. They said therefore unto him, when, What signs showest thou then that we may see and believe thee? What dost thou work? So he want, they want to see proof. Of course, they have seen that miracle that uh, they, they, in receiving the, the loaves that fed the 5,000 men, who knows how many women and children were there, 
It just counted them by the men. It was a tradition of the day that they'd, they'd count, take, uh, take a roll. <laughs> they count heads, they count the men. Okay. So as they saw the loaves, but consider this, and we'll, they'll bring this up. They're asking, they want a sign to show that he was the son of, the son of God. Certainly anything that, that would be done by God would be magnificent, like the parting of the Red Sea. The manna they came from from heaven, feeding the entire multitude of the Israeli nation. They weren't yet a kingdom yet, but yet the the count of the number of men was like six hundred thousand. I mean, they left Egypt. Now they had wives, they had children, and if you use today's uh, statistical methods, where you have so many, say say two children to every family, and they, these are very conservative. You've considered he, they were very prolific, <laughs> fruitful in the land of Egypt, and so much so that the Egyptians were afraid of them. So they were, they were multiplying much greater than, than, the, than the Egyptians themselves. So they were a very populous people. And so if you count 600,000 men, you multiply that by four to take, take account of the women and the children, perhaps, and it's, like I say, still very conservative, you have about 2.4 million people, about 2.5 million people. Now, this is, these, this is the number of people that God fed with manna out of heaven. Okay, every day, every day. And this is the amount of water that you consider how much, when, 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 when they went to, to war in Afghanistan, or in, in, uh, in uh, um, Iraq, they didn't just bring troops over. They didn't plan for just the tanks and the, and the jeeps and all the artillery and the aircraft. They had to plan for the supplies for these hundreds of thousands of men. And that's a major ordeal. That's, that's a major part of military planning is the logistics and supplying all this stuff. And, and whereas they required, I forget the numbers, but they required a certain number of gallons of water per person, per day, okay, for hygiene, for drinking, things like that. And it was immense. For, two point, for, for hundreds of thousands of men. Now you consider two and a half million people every day supplying food and drinking water and all the water needs and all that stuff. That's a major logistic ordeal. So that was a, a particularly impressive manifestation of the power of God. The, the manna from heaven and, and the watering for them. So at, And they bring this up in verse 31. Our fathers did eat manna in the desert, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Okay, so they bring up this miracle that God did. And so when they see Jesus, you fed 5,000. Okay, that's, that's significantly fewer than the 2.5 million people that were, were there in the desert that God fed. And so this is a, a, an order of mag, orders of magnitude of difference uh, between what God did with the manna and what Jesus did with the bread. So they want to see something that, that's on the same scale that would prove that Jesus indeed is uh, the Son of God. Okay? But then Jesus said to them, let's clarify things, Jesus said. Jesus said to them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven. God did. It wasn't Moses that gave him the bread. It was God. But my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. Now he's talking about something more important. He's not talking about the manna that, that God gave them. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. So whereas they received manna from heaven to sustain them physically, but they all died. But God is giving them the true bread of life himself. For the bread of God is he that which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. He's talking about himself. He's the one that gives them life. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. So they, so they realize, he's talking about something that, that, that uh, uh, um, e eternal life. You know, This is life-giving bread. And so they're asking, give us evermore this bread. Verse 35, and Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. So he says, I'm talking about me. I'm the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. And he that believeth on me shall never thirst. He's still talking about spiritual matters. If we're talking about, uh, we're looking for eternal life, this is a spiritual matter, not a physical matter. So those who come to Christ for spiritual life, 
will find it, and, and they shall never hunger, and they shall never thirst. They'll, they'll have plenty to digest, plenty of spiritual, spiritual food to digest. But I said unto you that ye have also have seen me and believe not. So there was, you've seen my miracle. You've seen what I teach. You've heard what I teach, but you still don't believe in me. You don't believe that I'm the Son of God. You don't believe that I am who I say I am. You don't believe I'm the bread of life that gives you life. Okay. Um, All that the Father giveth me shall come unto me, and him that cometh to me I will no wise cast out. So the, the uh, let's see here. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. So man, he's announcing his mission was to do the will of the Father to save mankind. Verse 39, and this is the Father's will which has sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. He's talking about those who would come to him. Uh, we'll see in a moment. He talks about that uh, in verse 44, no man can come to me except the Father which has sent me. Draw him, and I will raise him up in the last day. So the Father draws people to Christ. He uses the word to draw him. But the people who reject the word are not drawn to him. That's a fact. People who reject the word of God, the word of Christ, the, the gospel, they're not drawn to God. They're just not. They're not interested. Or they reject whatever, what's being taught. And so they're never drawn to Christ. So only those who are drawn to Christ are those who believe the, the gospel message. And that in their believing, their obedience, and their living of, uh, a life of righteousness, uh, that uh, they will be raised up on the last day, as Jesus said in verse 39, but should, should raise it up again in the last day. So in verse 41, the Jews murmured at him because he said, I am the bread of which came down from heaven. So they're having difficulty understanding what he means about he's the bread of life. They're still focused on the physical. And, he's, and they said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, who the father and mother we know? How is it that he saith, I came down from heaven? So there, there, there is an impediment to them that, you know, Jesus said that uh, a prophet is not given honor in his, own, in his hometown, his own country. You know, he, didn't, he wasn't given the right uh, credit for who he is. Because they all saw him as the son of Joseph and Mary. They all saw him. Yeah, we know his brothers and sisters. We grew up with him. He's this guy, and so they don't perceive him for the greatness that he is. They per don't perceive him as the Son of God. Jesus therefore answered and said, Murmur not among yourselves. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him. And I will raise him on the last day. We've discussed that. We're drawn by the power of the gospel. We're drawn by the message of the gospel. Anyone who rejects it is not drawn to Jesus. Only those who accept it receive it are drawn to Jesus. Okay. Um, let's see. So as we continue on with the idea, in verse 47, he, he says it more plainly. Instead of using metaphors with bread, uh, he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. He's making, he's, he can't get any plainer than that. You have to believe on me, and you'll have everlasting life. And he repeats that with the metaphor, I am that bread of life. He's the one that supplies us the sustenance, the one that, that, that uh, the living bread, the one that gives us the, uh, the message whereby we can find eternal life. Uh, Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. So that bread that they received from God, it was just physical nutrition. It was physical sustenance. It, wasn't, didn't, it didn't give them everlasting life. That manna from heaven that God gave them was just physical. Jesus is giving them something much more important and valuable. In verse 50, this is the bread which cometh down from heaven. It's talking about himself. That a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread. He's saying, this is the bread which you, when you eat, you'll live forever. I'm that bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Okay, so I'm that bread of life that gives eternal life. And so the meta, met, it's all metaphorical. He's, he's using images and figures of speech to, to say that I'm the one that gives you everlasting life. Come to me. Okay, 
And of course, it's spiritual. And as he said, and the bread that I will give is my flesh. Now he's referring to his crucifixion. He's going to give his life for the sins of the world, which I will give for the life of the world. So he's going to make the sacrifice, give his body to be crucified to save mankind. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? They're still stuck in the physical. They're still thinking on, he's going to give us his flesh. Is this cannibalism or what? You know, they, they don't understand he's speaking metaphorically. Even though he's saying it clearly, then metaphorically, then clearly he's relating it all to their hunger and having to eat of the loaves from before. In verse 51, 53, then Jesus said to them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. He's still using metaphors. He's still using figures of speech, saying, except you uh, partake of me, unless you, unless you believe in me, on me, you don't, there's no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath e- eternal life, and I will raise him up at that last day. You partake of the teachings of Christ, the spiritual teachings. Your spirit is fed, and, in, and your spirit finds everlasting life. The physical will die. The physical will be done away. In fact, all of, all of matter, as I understand it, will be burned up with fervent heat. It's the spirit that benefits from, from the teachings here. And he's, so as he's using his body and his flesh and his blood, it's all about coming to Christ, believing on him for eternal life. And they're still stuck with this manna from heaven from that, that, that uh, came down when they were in the wilderness. They're still stuck in the, the, in the physical thinking, that, what's Jesus talking about giving his flesh, eating his, bl- his flesh and drinking his blood? Okay. <clears throat> um, so as in verse 44, Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up the last day. He's talking about spiritually speaking. He's not talking about actually eating his blood, eating, eating his flesh and drinking his blood. And he's not referring to the Lord's Supper here. You note, this is way before the Lord's Supper was ever instituted. Way before the implements of the, the unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine were ever used to remember, commemorate his, his death on the cross. This is, he's talking about, you ha- he's trying to get them to let loose of their, their ties to the law of Moses in the sense that that's, they think that's where they have salvation. And their ties to their being of the blood of Abraham, that that's what gives them eternal life. He's trying to get them to break them that. He said, you know, you have to believe in me. Um, 55, for my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. It's real meat, that is meat for the soul, and it's real drink. As drink for the soul. He doesn't mean literally his body and his blood, but rather his teaching of eternal life. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, shall, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven, as not your fathers did eat manna. So what I'm talking about is different. They got the physical. I'm talking about spiritual matters. And are, they are dead. He that eateth of his, this bread shall live forever. Okay. Can I say it any better? Did I? Did, I, did it make sense? Um. Well, it makes me think of um, like with John 1, when it says in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then in verse 14, it says the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And how when we take that Word, that is Him. Yeah. His words are Him. Yeah. He is the Word. So when we take that in and it becomes a part of us, he was, but do you not think too that he was in a manner weeding out those that, you know, because he talks at one point about the fact that he speaks in parables yeah. so that those who won't, who aren't going to understand, aren't going to see, are out, you know, like, so that those that will see and will hear, they're the ones that are going to understand. They're going to yeah. get it. Well, I know that it's interesting to, yeah, what you say it's interesting because like it said that he did, it was prophesied he would speak in parables to, uh, to confuse or confound those that, that uh, wouldn't see. And, and it would enable those. On the other hand, the parables are, are meant to enlighten us. It's a, a parable. It's, it's a story laid down beside, you have the physical story, 
It's laid down beside the, the spiritual teaching. So a parable, it's like, uh, you know, and they're in parallel. They lay down by, side by side. So in a way, the parables clarified things. It, it related to those common parables. stories, spiritual matters. But in another way, it did obscure it to those who just wouldn't, can't, couldn't see it. Like we saw that in the Pharisees and these men here, they were they were still stuck on. What do you mean, give us his flesh to eat? What's he talking about? You know, and they're they're still stuck on that. This is Jesus, the son of Joseph and Mary. You know, we know who we know who they are. He is, and, and so they're still stuck in the spiritual. And so, in a way, these uh, these allegories, these uh, there's the the figurative speech he's using, metaphors, it's, it's confusing them. And like you say, it, in a way, it's, it's, I don't know if it's meant to weed it out. I don't think he was trying to, how, he was trying, I think he was trying to get them to understand, I'm the one you need to believe on. And he was using it in such a way that that bread you're, you're focused on, you need to break ties with that, that desire for the physical bread. What you need is the spiritual bread that brings real life. And he said, when he said, my, my flesh is meat indeed, it's real meat, and my blood is real drink. Okay. Right, because they knew from the law that you don't eat people. Right. Eat. Yeah. You don't drink the blood. This right. Is, this is the literal blood of animals. Yeah. They knew that from the law. Yeah. And that may have been the big stumbling block. Been, yeah. I mean, <laughs> teaching the things of God, he's going to be telling us to eat mm -hmm. him and drink his blood because we don't do that. Right. Right. Yeah, they sh you would think so, that I can't imagine that he was talking above their head. Uh, I think he was trying to explain things in a way that, that they would understand, relating their physical appetites with the spiritual needs. Um, we can go, uh, there was a, I think it was a, the, the letter to the church in Laodicea. They thought that they were so rich, they had everything they ever wanted and needed, but the fact is, spiritually speaking, they were, they were wretched, they were naked, they were hungry. They didn't have what they needed. Uh, because, and they thought, they, and they, Laodicea was, was a, a city that was uh, well known for its wealth. They actually had financial, it was like the center of finance, the center of commerce. Like we think of New York City or Chicago, where the, 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 they have so much going on there, commerce going on, that, that there's so much wealth there. And so it was in Laodicea, thinking themselves to be so rich, but as far as Christ looked at them, they were wretched, they were poor, you know, and, and uh, spiritually speaking. So these, these men, they, they, uh, they were stuck on the physical without relating, understanding these, these, the spiritual. Okay. So... Um, and this was a hard teaching. As we saw in verse 39, these things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Many, therefore, of the disciples, when they had heard this, said, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? Who can believe this stuff? Who can accept it? Who can understand it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, his disciples, that were his chosen ones, the twelve, he said to them, doth this offend you? Are you stumbling over this? Is this causing you to, to uh, causing you problems in understanding this? What if, what and if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? What if you saw me go up into heaven where I was before? How would that convince you? He was trying to teach them that that he's the Son of God, that he's the one that the, the bread of life that Father has sent down for real life, spiritual life, that he's the Son of God. So, disciples, what if you saw me go up in heaven? What then? Would you believe then? He says in 63, it is the spirit that quickeneth. It's the spirit that makes life. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So he clarifies it. I'm not talking about physical stuff. I'm talking about spiritual matters wherein is real life. Um, and it's the, our physical being doesn't benefit from the teachings I'm teaching. Well, it does. But the real import is the spiritual aspects of what he's trying to teach. Believe on me, and you'll have everlasting life. Um, uh, it's the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not, and who should betray him. 
it wasn't that he's not saying that he chose Judas Iscariot for the sole purpose that he would betray him. That's not why he selected Judas Iscariot. He's saying that he knew who would betray him because he knew the nature of men. And um, <clears throat> he knew who would believe him and who would not. Okay? It's, it's, sometimes people get the idea that Jesus intended Jesus, uh, Judas to be lost. He intended Judas to, to uh, betray him. And he chose him for that very purpose because there had to be somebody who would betray him. No. Judas betrayed Jesus on his own accord, of his own selection, his own choice. He knew that Jesus would be the, Judas, Jesus knew that Judas would be the one to, to betray him, but he didn't choose him for that purpose. It's just that Judas made his own personal choice. Okay. And he said, therefore said I unto you that no man can come to me except it were given unto him by the, of my father. You know what? It's a blessing that we're able to receive the word, the gospel. The fact that we're here this morning, that we chose to, to believe the, the gospel message. It's a blessing that we have uh, the, uh, we have the mindset to believe the gospel. Because if we were hardened hearts, if we have a mind to reject the proof that we had received, then we'd be lost. And so the fact that we have been given the opportunity to come to Christ, it's given us to, by the Father to come to him. In verse 66, from that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. It was just too hard to teach him for them. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, will ye also go away? Are you going to leave me too? I chose you specifically. And you're go are you going to leave too, like these other guys? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Peter knew. Peter knew that, that Jesus had the teachings that, that lead to eternal life. If he didn't, wasn't impressed by what Jesus had just discourse he just given to those men that had followed after him to Capernaum, then uh, you know we know from from uh, Matthew 16 that it was Peter who confessed that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God, and so he recognized that Jesus has the words of eternal life. He has the instructions, the way to go. In verse 69, And we believe and assure that thou art the, that Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? You know, it's not the disciples that chose Jesus. Jesus chose his disciples. Jesus chose who would be his disciples. And so he chose his apostles. They were they were selected particularly by Jesus himself. He says, and one of you is the devil. He spake of, a Jews, he spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he, was, he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. But it's not, like I said, it's not that Jesus chose Simon knowing he would betray him, but rather he chose Judas Iscariot. Did I say Simon? I keep on mixing up these words. He chose, chose Jesus, Judas Iscariot, as one of his apostles. And incidentally, when he sent out the 70 disciples to preach, repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, to go out to all the villages around uh, in Judea, Judas Iscariot was one of them. He went out and preached, repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He had authority over the demons to cast them out of the, out of the people that, that he had possessed. He had the power to heal. He had seen these same powers of the other 11 head. And, it, and that we're amazed at, that the authority that had been given him. And yet, he, in spite of all this, he chose himself to betray, to betray the Christ. And, but, and like I said, as Jesus knew who it was and knew what he would do, but he didn't choose him because of that. He chose him to, because to, uh, Judas could have chosen all along what he would do. He had his own personal choice, just like we do have our own personal choices. I hope that's helpful. I hope it's not overbearing, but but uh, um, <clears throat> it's a, it's it's I can, it's very easy to jump to conclusions. Say he's talking about the, the Lord's Supper, and like I said last week, it's perfectly understandable that those who partake of His flesh and blood will live forever. 
in the sense of those who partake of the Lord's Supper will live forever because those who partake of the Lord's Supper are Christians. Those who partake of the Lord's Supper partake of the unleavened bread, which is his body. It, it symbolizes his body. And those who partake of the, the, the fruit of the vine partake of his blood. And since these Christians, since they are there, they are Christians. And since they are Christians, they have everlasting life. So that's reasonable. But that's not what this is talking about. This passage is talking about that he himself is the one that would save them. He has the words of life. Um, and he is the Son of God. Well, but not all people that take the Lord's Supper will have eternal life. But all people who take in his word and live by it will. Yes. So yeah, we, if you apply yeah. it that way, mm -hmm. you have to, then you're saying that yeah. by taking the Lord's Supper, you've got eternal life. And that's not the case. Well, it is. But here's why. And as I mentioned this last week. Um, every one of, everyone in every, every place that they're serving communion, are partaking of the bread and the fruit of the vine. Every one of them. But not every one of them is partaking of the communion with Christ. Every one of them is eating the bread and everyone is drinking that cup. But not everyone is partaking of the Lord's Supper, which is a communion with Christ. Only Christians commune with Christ. Everybody else don't. And every, you know, every, every, uh, before we partake of his communion, James will read from uh, 1 Corinthians reminding us the way in which we are partake of the Lord's Supper in a worthy manner. We can partake of it in a worthy manner. We're, re we're reading judgment upon ourselves. So there, too, is just because you're partaking of the Lord's Supper, you don't have everlasting life. That's, that's true. Okay. So, so uh, everybody who takes in the Word. Yes. And eats on that Word as far as making it a part of them. They are they the ones that will. They're exactly. Making it. Then they're, yes. They're living by it. Yes, exactly right. Okay. All right, well, I'm actually finishing on time this time. <laughs> um, appreciate your comments and your interest and, and the questions. I have, I have a question. Okay. Um, on verse 27, when it talks about the seed your version said that God the Father had sealed him, and the New King James says God the Father has set his seal on him. And yes. No, I don't think so. I think that seal in First Corinthians, that's talking about the Holy Spirit. They actually had the miraculous manifestation of the Holy Spirit, and it was a seal proving that uh, they were with God. You know, the, the, the ability to perform miracles proved that they, they were with God. I guess coming out of um, the denominational world, you know, a lot of them will use that. The fact that we're sealed means that we can't sin and we're not going to, um. we can't lose our salvation, things like that. And I didn't know, I mean, and I know that it's not referring to that. But I didn't know if that's the same reference, if that's the same thought process that's coming from the fact that God sealed, you know, his seal was on him. Is that the same manner in which it's on us? In that, but you're talking about, the author is, it's, to, to show that he was from God. Yes. So that, it's a seal of approval. Way. You know, you've heard on commercials, perhaps, the, the seal of, of approval, the, how, the better, but <laughs> Yes, good housekeeping seal of approval. I think that's, that's very similar. In uh, that passage, yes, I think he was saying that God has put a seal upon me. Okay. He's, he's testified of me. He's, right. he's approved. He's, he's told you, every, every one of you, I'm the real deal. That's what I think he's saying. And therefore, we receive that same seal of approval in the sense that we've done. It's that approval. Yes, exactly. It's proving. That's that seal. It's like walking around the seal says, I am of God. I'm a Christian. Look, let me show you. That seal was, was the power, ability, manifestation of the Holy Spirit. That was one thing that being like the denominational world, it was more like they talked about being like a seal as in you've been capped off. You know? Yeah. No. In you, you're capped off, it mm -hmm. can't be undone. 
and it was like. Mm, yeah. That's like a hermetically vacuum packed seal, right? <laughs> I don't think that's what it's talked about. Thank you.